Hello everybody, my name is Maribel Adestaki. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the night lab at the University of California, San Diego. In this video, I'm going to give an overview of the process of importing data into Chime 2. Uh, we'll be mainly focusing on importing raw sequence data and also demultiplexing of these raw reads. Uh, in this video, I assume that you're already familiar with the core concepts of Chime 2 that was covered in a previous video. Um, especially with regards to the semantic types and the file formats uh, of Chime 2 artifact, uh, as these become pretty important component of importing files into Chime 2. Okay, this is a basic overview diagram of a simple workflow in Chime 2. This workflow starts at the top left with raw sequences uh, and goes through the demultiplexing of sequences, denoising of our reads to form a future table and representative sequence files. Uh, then it creates a phylogenetic tree as well as a taxonomy file. And finally it runs some diversity analysis and to produce uh, some nice results visualizations. Uh, what is nice about Chime 2 is that you can import your data at virtually any of these steps in the pipeline and continue to use the various available plugins downstream without the need for uh, the upstream files. So for example, if a collaborator gives you a biome table that they have produced elsewhere, say in R using a new in-house pipeline, then you can simply import that biome table uh, without the need to have to access the original raw sequence files. And you can just work your way downstream uh, through the available plugins and analyze the data using uh, the new biome table you've imported. However, before you can do that, you need to import your data into Chime 2 in the correct format. That is to say, you need to know the type of file that you have, as well as the format, uh, if needed, in which it was made. In this series of videos, we're covering the entire process starting from raw sequences. So in this video, uh, I'm going to mainly focus on describing the importing process from raw sequence level. Uh, but I just wanted to re-emphasize that importing can happen at any of these steps. So before we start, I just wanted to give a disclaimer here. And this is purely uh, my opinion based on my experience working with a variety of data types, uh, peer previous Chime 2 workshops and answering questions on the Chime 2 forum for the last few years. Um, and I found out that the importing of raw step uh, is often the most confusing part of the Chime 2 pipeline for new users. I've personally found this to be true with any bioinformatics software that I've used, so this is definitely not exclusive just to Chime 2 by any means. Um, and the main reason why this step can be confusing is that there are many, many ways your data can exist in tens to hundreds uh, of variations that exist to date. And only one of those is the correct one for any given data. So you really need to know what type of data you have and in what format it's in. Uh, and so this is often a difficult concept for new users who may not be familiar with this uh, type of data. And just so you don't think I'm exaggerating when I say there can be hundreds of different data formats, uh, this is a list of 46 importable types and 75 importable formats, um, which my Chime 2 environment currently recognizes. And of course, there can be even more depending on if you have any additional third-party plugins, uh, Chime 2 plugins installed. Um, and I show this not to intimidate you, but rather to reassure you that if you do find yourself struggling with this portion of the pipeline uh, when you're analyzing your own data for the first time, just know that you're not alone. And uh, the good news is that once you have imported data into Chime 2, uh, basically the hardest part is over and everything downstream is much simpler and easier to uh, find help with. Now, while there's no automatic way of detecting your uh, data type and format, there is at least one resource that I know of that uh, may be useful in helping you make sense of your data. Um, this is an example uh, of a excellent quick reference flowchart uh, made by Nick Bokulich. Um, this can be found on the Chime 2 forum in the link I uh, provided here. And this can help identify 
uh, which type uh, and data uh, format of your input uh, files may be in majority of cases. Uh, perhaps not all of them, but it will do a pretty good job of uh, for, for most of the cases. Okay, now let's take a closer look uh, here at the process involved in importing your raw sequences into Chime 2. So far up to this point, you have completed your carefully designed experiment. You have collected your samples and extracted DNA from them. You've amplified your target gene of interest, for example, in this case, the V4 region of the 16S rRNA. And you've added unique barcodes to the reads from each sample. And of course, ever so carefully recorded those uh, per sample barcodes in your metadata file. Next, you'll pull all of these different samples together and run it through your sequencing machine. The sequencing machine then performs its magic and gives you some outputs uh, in the form of FASTQ files. I'll describe FASTQ files in more detail a bit later, but essentially these are the files which contain the actual sequence information of your read. You'll have one FASTQ file that holds information about the actual sequences, and another FASTQ file that is specific to the barcode sequences. Uh, for simplicity's sake, this example is just demonstrating sequences of the forward reads only. But if you have paired in data, uh, that is to say if you've sequenced the reverse reads as well, then you will receive an additional FASTQ file that holds information on the reverse read. So what is a FASTQ file? Well, you can think of FASTQ files as essentially a text file that holds various information about your sequences in a somewhat standardized format. These files are built uh, on the older FASTA format that have been around for many years, most popularly perhaps uh, used with the 454 Pyro sequencing platform. And the major difference between them is that FASTQ files hold additional information about the quality of each base call. Uh, this is in fact where we get the Q in FASTQ name, um, which tells us that if this is a FASTA file with quality scores. In a FASTQ file, each read is described in exactly four lines. The first line uh, that starts with the at symbol is a sequence identifier. This line is not really something that is well standardized. Um, so what is written here can vary from different sequencing facilities, but generally holds some information about the run, the equipment ID, the run ID, uh, lane number, uh, perhaps the date, and so on. The second line is your actual sequences. Uh, in this example, this is our DNA sequences from our amplicons. But of course, if this was our barcode FASTQ files, for example, then this would simply correspond to the seven or eight nucleotide long, uh, nucleotide long unique barcodes. The third line denoted by the plus sign is here is a plus placeholder line, which can technically hold uh, a variety of information uh, that you may want uh, to include. But these days you mainly see just a plus sign indicating that this is a placeholder line. And finally, the fourth line holds quality scores corresponding to the sequences. These quality scores are coded using a series of ASCII characters, which are then translated into numerical values downstream. These quality scores, uh, also known as FRED scores or Q scores, are calculated by the sequencing machine, and they tell us about the quality of our nucleotides in terms of error probabilities. So for example, the question mark character uh, corresponding to the ASCII code 63 here, uh, translates to a quality score of 30. A quality score of 30 indicates that the probability that the corresponding nucleotide being incorrect is 1 in 1000 or is 99.9% .9 accurate. In other words, if we saw a 
G, for example, nucleotide in our reads, the likelihood of that G having been called G by error, uh, and in fact it was meant to be, let's say, a C, is 1 in 1000. And these quality scores are very important and become a crucial component of our quality control steps and filtering steps uh, that you'll learn more about in later videos. Okay, now that we have a better understanding of uh, our FASTQ files, let's go back to our example data. So again, here we have on the left our sample metadata file, which contains information about each of our samples, including their unique barcodes. In the middle, we have a FASTQ file for our barcodes. And on the right hand, uh, we have another FASTQ file uh, for our actual sequences. What is important to emphasize here is that at this point, our data is still multiplexed, meaning that all of our sequencing data is contained in one location, in one file, and they are not linked to their original sample source yet. And what we ultimately want is to group all of our sequences from the multiplexed FASTQ file, um, and we want to demultiplex them so that each sequence is paired with the sample it originally came from. In other words, we want all of the orange sequences to be paired with our orange sample, the blue, the blue sequences with the blue sample, and so on. And the way we can achieve this is by simply mapping the sequences back to their sample of origin using those unique barcodes that we added at the beginning. So this is a very simple overview of how the demultiplexing process actually works. Uh, we start from the right with our sequence FASTQ files. We take the first read we see there, and now we move to the barcode FASTQ file and match it with the first read we see in that file. It's worth pointing out that the order of sequences between these two FASTQ files is paired. And are always matched when they are produced by the sequencing machine. So what I mean is that read number one in our sequence file will always correspond to read number one in the, bar the barcode file. Same, same thing with read number two in the sequence file will always correspond to read number two in the barcode file and so on. Now in our barcode file, we read the unique uh, barcode identifier that is associated with that read. And finally, we can map that barcode uh, using our metadata file and identify exactly which sample uh, that barcode corresponds to, so meaning what sample our original read came from. In this case, uh, the orange sample was our uh, source, uh, our original sample source. So we repeat this demultic, demultiplexing process for each read until all of our reads have been assigned to one of our samples. When the demultiplexing process is complete, instead of having one FASTQ for all of our samples, we'll now have one FASTQ file per sample. And we no longer need our barcode file because we have already extracted information that uh, we used from them. So this is what we refer to as a demultiplexed files. And of course, when you are working within the CHIME2 environment, you will only actually see a single CHIME2 artifact. However, we now know that the underlying structure of that artifact is a series of individual FASTQ files. In fact, if you were to export uh, this artifact at this point, you'll see that all of these FASTQ files exist as a separate file within it. And of course, again, if you have sequenced paired end data, then you will have two FASTQ files per sample, one corresponding to the forward reads and the other to your reverse reads. It is also worth mentioning here that at this point, that if you have paired end reads, your forward and reverse reads are still not joined together. That is something that happens at a later step. At this point, they are simply held, uh, paired together, but as separate files. 
Now, depending on the sequencing facility where your data came from, you may receive your data in either multiplexed form, such as uh, in our example here, or demultiplexed. Um, so if you receive multiplex file, then of course you will need to demultiplex your reads. Uh, but if you receive them already demultiplexed, then you can simply skip this demultiplex uh, demultiplexing process in Chime 2, and you can just move forward to the next step, uh, which will be denoising and clustering. The easiest way to know if you have received multiplex or demultiplex de data from your facility is by simply looking to see if you have received one FASTQ file uh, that contains all of your samples or if you have separate FASTQ files for each sample. So this concludes the lecture tutorial on importing and demultiplexing routes into Chime 2. Uh, in the next section you will get to actually uh, get a hands-on experience on how to import your raw FASTQ files in Chime 2. And we'll see you again at the next video in this uh, tutorial series, which will be about denoising or clustering your data. Thank you very much for joining.